the patient will turn around and say, do you know what I'm going through? Do you know what my family is going through? I say, yes, I do. I've worn those mocassins. I've gone through it twice. I understand what you're going through. I understand what your family is going through. I understand what your friends are going through. And this is the ace up my sleeve, Anne. And if I can do it, so can you. Welcome to Doctor Story. Today we have with us someone who is an amazing person and she has some really amazing stories to share with us, Neerja Malik. She has been through a lot, including cancer and cancer therapy, but she's been through it and she's done it really well because she is very resilient and we're going to learn this from her today. She's handled everything that has come her way so well and that makes her such an inspiring person. So with that, I'd like to welcome you to our little meet. Thank you so much, Anne. I've been looking forward to this ever since we had a rather long chat. Somehow <laughs> we got along like a house on fire. And I'm sure that this interview is going to light up many minds. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hope so. So let's talk a little bit about... Uh, going through cancer itself. Mm -hmm. So how, how was it that you were diagnosed? What happened before? Huh. So I'm very good with dates. I remember them with uh, monotonous regularity and some of my friends get very irritated. Especially when I say, oh, you know, I've known her since I was two. And that friend of mine says, you want to tell people your age, go ahead. Why are you telling them mine? Oh, she's seven years older. Oh, that one is six years younger. You know, it's all that. So another date. On the 2nd of February, 1998. 2nd of Feb is my father's birthday. So the date stuck in my mind. I felt a twinge of pain, a, not even pain, a little twinge. Not even an ache, just a twinge. Uh, in Hindi, you would call it chuban, chuban. On the left side of my chest. So as is usual, a hand goes there. And I felt a little lump. And uh, I used to do a lot of aerobics and I was very slim line. And I thought to myself that I'd overdone it and I forgot. Now you see, I have so much of faith in God because on the 12th of Feb, 10 days later, I got the same twitch, the same chuban. And as is one, which I had forgotten about those 10 days, touched the spot and I got the shock of my life. In 10 days, something that was not even pea-sized had grown enormously to a larger lump. That is what alerted me. The first time in 98, I demanded to see a doctor. And uh, that is how that happened in 98 on the Friday the 13th, on the 12th, I went to the doctor. He said uh, he wants to do a mammogram and he wants to do an FNAC, a fine needle aspiration cytology. And uh, he said, please register. So when I went to him, I told him the story that, you know, on the second, 10 days earlier, I felt a twinge and you know, today, uh, 10 days later on the 12th, I felt this twinge again. And from this small, it had become that big. And then he did a very thorough physical. He's touching my armpit and he's saying, oh, and how long have you had this here? 
What are you talking about? Had what, where? And he made me feel my armpit. And the lump that I felt in my armpit was much bigger than the tumor in my breast. And when they did, during, after, during my surgery, they removed 21 nodes. They discovered that nine of those 21 were malignant. They were cancerous. And uh, that is what happened the first time. The second time, on, again, <laughs> it's related to a friend's birthday. On the 17th of November in 2004, I decided to lie down on my stomach. And uh, because from, from the time of my surgery in, in uh, 98, I hadn't slept in my stomach. And I used to just sleep in my stomach in my young days. So when I turned onto my stomach, I felt very uncomfortable in the breast, which is the right breast. And uh, I touched it and I, I instinctively knew that it felt exactly like the other one had felt so many years earlier. And I woke up my husband and I said, you know, I think uh, it's happened again. And I explained to him what I meant. And he said, well, now I told you how I started my counseling. I was going to the hospital every day. So he said, well, you go to the hospital every day, so just get yourself checked up. So I said, yes, yeah, that's what I'll do. So that is how I got diagnosed the second time, both times, because I felt that God had intervened and given me these twinges and this urge to sleep in my stomach so that I could be aware. I would like to digress a little here. So one girl, she came running up to me. Her mother had cancer. I was counseling her. And she told me, she said, Deja, I, I hate the first of child. And I said, why? She said, because my mother was diagnosed with that. She's looking very sad. And I said, you know something? If I were you, I would celebrate it twice. She said, what? I said, yes. Because 1st of Jan is, begins your new year, we all celebrate it, whether we are Christians or Hindus or Muslims, world over. First of Jan. And secondly, I would celebrate the fact that your mother was diagnosed. She said, what do you mean? I said, because she was diagnosed, she was able to get treated. So isn't that a happy, good, lucky day? I said, I was diagnosed on Friday the 13th. I'm very happy with Friday. The whole world will think, unlucky number, Friday the 13th. For me, it was very lucky because I was diagnosed and therefore I could get my treatment done because I knew what the matter was. So it's just, it's just an, how you look at it. It might be the same thing, but you can look at it like this like this, or like this, or like that. But if you change it to make it easier for yourself and for those around you, then life is good. Answer your question. When you were diagnosed the first time, what was it like to hear this diagnosis? What did you feel? <laughs> so my husband and I sat in the car and I took him along with me because the previous day I'd had my mammogram and, and my FNAC. And I promise you, 
you know i don't know if when we used when we play holy you know it's the big it looks like an enlarged injection and you go around pumping water colored water at everyone i promise you it looked like that huge needle and huge oh it was awful and it pained a lot 19 so i took him the next day and we went to this we went to the pathology department and the head of pathology turned to me and she said this is malik i'm afraid i've got bad news i said yes doctor she said you've got cancer but after that happened we took the reports to dr stone free was an onco radiologist he's the one who had diagnosed me the first time and uh, the first time meaning the previous day <laughs> you know you lose track of time and so he promptly took me to immediately he took me to the surgeon and uh, we met uh, dr hemantraj and he took me to the oncologist and we met uh, dr ramesh ramesh and then the whole day went because they wrote out a whole lot of tests and so i got busy doing those tests and on the way back in the car i turned to my husband and i said you know i have two lunches today so can you ring up this particular friend and tell her that i won't be coming for lunch please thank you and we're sitting in the car and we on our way home and he rings her up and he says you know neecha won't be coming for lunch today so obviously she'll say why not and he said uh, she's got cancer now and you won't believe it till then my mind was on autopilot i hadn't had time to deal with the fact that i have cancer so my immediate and involuntary reaction was to turn to him and give him a biff or a mukka on his arm and i said why couldn't you have told her i've got a bad stomach why did you have to tell her i've got cancer not because i was scared of people knowing about <laughs> cancer but i hadn't come to terms with cancer i hadn't come to terms with what had happened and then i quickly had to dry my tears i started crying and i said the other friend i'll go home it was her birthday today my other friend veena shiva and i said i'll go home and call her because the kids were coming back from school they were seven they were seven years old my twins and uh, i had to behave as if nothing had happened so i didn't have time to deal with it and then they told me that you know you have uh, you have 25% chances of survival and that's not in india only if you go to america or france because in those days they had in 98 they had started stem cell research in those two countries and i wept for three days i wept not because i was scared but because my twins were only seven i didn't want to leave them and after the third day you know they say tube light enlightenment that happened and uh, i suddenly realized i said who told me this did god come down and say he wagged his finger at me and said you know you've got very short time to live <laughs> you better count your days your days are numbered you better start counting backwards no 
it was a human being who said all this. And I dried my tears. No more tears. You know, that lovely shampoo. And I made a determined decision. And I said that I will live for my twins. Thrilled, Nishjay, determined decision. And then I went through cancer again, and I went through my uterus and ovaries removal, and then I went through a lump they found here, and then I went through two lumps they found in my legs, and various surgeries, and then two years back, septicemia, and I needed 210 injections in the jugular because the wings in my arms could not be ever used. I had ports both times, and the the veins in my foot were used for withdrawal and for insertion 204 onwards. And they gave up, my, the veins in my feet gave, gave up. They just collapsed, they didn't work. So they had to, you know, enter here and give me injections. So yes, I took it all uh, with never a thought of no questions asked. Will I survive it? Will I not? So I had a goal in mind, which is what I've learned to tell all my patients. The goal was, I'm living for my twins. I'm living for my parents. I'm living for my sister and her family. I'm living for my husband. I'm living for my in-laws. I'm living for my friends. I'm living for my patients. I'm living for so many people who love me. And I'm living to pass things on to people. Because if you go to a cancer patient and you tell him, psychologist goes, everyone goes, pat them on the back and say, hey, be positive. And the patient will turn around and say, do you know what I'm going through? Do you know what my family is going through? I say, yes, I do. I've worn those more cancers. I've gone through it twice. I understand what you're going through. I understand what your family is going through. I understand what your friends are going through. And this is the ace up my sleeve, Am. And if I can do it, so can you. So that is how it I deal with my patients. I tell them three things. One, consider the word cancer as only a word. When I talk about a glass, a cell phone, a fan, a table, do I break into beads of sweat? No. But when I hear the word cancer, oh my God, why? Because 50 years, 100 years, the ideas have come down that cancer is the big C. It's a bad word. You die, you die, you die. But things have changed. Science has advanced. And uh, if in 98 I had a surgery and there's a big hole in my armpit, there's like a well where they took out the 21 nodes. In 2004, I had a microsurgery. There's no well there and they took out 38 nodes. And God is great, not even one was malignant. And now you don't have to take out the nodes, you go for a sentinel node. So you see how science has advanced. I went through chemotherapy, I, I vomited, I was so nauseous. In 98, in, in 2004, I didn't vomit even once because the chemotherapies are improving and the medicine that is meant for the side effects of chemotherapy, they're coming a long way too. What about radiation? It was only cobalt and cobalt, the rays go straight. So they go through your breast and they go right into the heart and the lungs behind. Now you can shop for your radiation where there's so many different kinds. And 
the rays are simulated in such a way that they move out and they come and only affect the bed of the tumor. They do not go to the organs behind, like through the breast. No, they stop here where the tumor was. They do not go through to the heart or the lungs. So there's been such a vast improvement between 98 and 2004. And I tell people, I said, listen, early detection. Cancer is curable. Prevention is better than cure. Cancer is curable. Cancer is conquerable. And the two things that I have spread like anything. One, the words of my father who said, face, don't fight cancer. And two, that I call myself a conqueror, not a survivor. And that is where the phrase, cancer is conquerable, has come. <laughs> Thanks to you, yours uh, truly. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud to have been able to make an impact. And I'm proud to tell people that, yes, cancer is conquerable, curable. And comes a time when we can go to a chemist and give a prescription for cancer. And he gives us the tablets and we smile and we go home. God willing, that too shall come to pass. Thank, Thank you so you. much for doing this interview, for spending so yeah. much time with us. Yeah, God. it's been such a pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you, Anne, and thank you to all the listeners who are listening in. And God bless everyone, and the divinity in me bows down to the divinity in all of you.